Excited to welcome current Denver Nugget assistant coach Popeye Jones to the basketball podcast. A former NBA player played for six different teams, including Dallas, Toronto, Boston, Denver, Washington, and Golden State. Following his 11-year NBA career, Jones decided to pursue coaching basketball. He first worked as a player development coach for the Dallas Mavericks, and his career took off from there. And then got assistant coaching positions with the New Jersey Brooklyn Nets, Indiana, Philadelphia, and Denver. Bye-bye. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. Uh, happy to be here. Well, um, two things. I grew up in Toronto, so I remember watching you play and uh, <laughs> great, great, great experiences watching you play. And then secondly, I played hockey and that was my first exposure to, uh, you know, what professional coaching was at youth levels on up. And I know your two sons, um, Caleb and Seth, uh, play in the NHL and have a great yeah. success and great career. So let's start with that one, Coach. Uh, what yeah. maybe have you learned from hockey that uh, has helped your basketball coaching? Uh, I think that uh, the biggest thing, and we're talking NHL level now, and I guess you, we can talk minor league level as well, uh, the togetherness that, that that NHL teams have. Not that NBA teams are not together, but, you know, I, obviously I was just in Dallas visiting them and we were talking about this this about this topic that they do everything together you know hockey teams they eat together they they almost sleep together but uh basketball teams you know you, you get more two or three guys going to dinner over here two or three guys going to dinner this way but they're really 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 togetherness is I always thought was really special in, in the nhl level well, I can't encourage coaches if they haven't watched, uh, you know, Amazon has the all or nothing with the Toronto Maple Leafs or different ones like that. You're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Those hockey ones are so interesting to watch and just the different kind of rituals and routines and the camaraderie that they have is just tremendous to be able to watch and see how coaches can apply it maybe to basketball as well. Right. And then I had I actually I went to game one. Uh, which was awesome. And as you know, the Avs won the Stanley Cup. So I had to rub that in a little bit last week when I was down in Dallas visiting those guys. Like, when are you guys going to win the cup where I can drink out of it? <laughs> that will be fun. And anyone that knows the history of the Stanley Cup, it is true that literally anyone could drink out of it. So Right. So I'm looking forward to that day. Hopefully it'll come soon for me. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be a lot of fun. And uh, this is a great topic that uh, that you suggested. Great time of year. I mean, you just mentioned that uh, your team had their first practice with the summer league team and talking about helping young people become professional mm -hmm. and uh, indoctrinating them into the NBA. And uh, my community, my basketball immersion membership community in the online community, it's called onboarding which is integrating people and getting them excited and getting new members inspired. And is that a similar process? That's the first part is to get them excited about being a part of your franchise. It, it is, you know, and obviously they're excited because they're in the NBA now, Chris, but not only get them, getting them excited about being in, in your franchise, but getting them excited about the work that needs to be done in order to be a pro, uh, you know, when my coaching career started, maybe the first guy that I can remember kind of working with as a young player was Brandon Bass in Dallas and uh, really enjoyed the time and um, how close we got, you know, and teaching them how to be a pro. Uh, the biggest thing to me is routine and watching guys develop routines. And uh, for me, that sticks out to me after playing 11 years and now almost coaching 20, Two guys um, as a player stick out to me was Dirk Nowitzki and then an older Michael Jordan, who still had a routine when I played with him in Washington. Uh, but Dirk was, he did the same thing the same way every single day and sometimes twice a day, the same on-court routine, the same, uh, you know, weightlifting routines, even though, you know, different body styles, but his routine and his times was really impressive uh, and trying to teach young guys, you know, I know in college, yeah, you have a routine when you come out of college, but that routine is, is with a whole group of guys. Uh, as a pro, you got to understand that how do I establish the routine that's best for me? Uh, how do I, I'm always on time, which is really important. I'm coachable. I'm not only that, I'm a good teammate. Um, last year for us, it was Bones Highland who had a terrific rookie season, but Teaching him, you know, he played two years of college, uh, but teaching him uh, routine and how to develop that routine uh, during the season was important. And now he came back. He did practice today. He's not going to play in the summer league. But talking to him about him establishing 
a summer routine. And he talked to me a little bit about that today. I always laughed at him, a young kid. I told him, I said, hey, you need to start doing your push-ups before bed. And the first thing he said to me, he goes, man, I've been doing 150 push-ups every night. He goes, I've gotten so strong. I said, yeah, because you're still a young kid. You need that. But but <laughs> establishing that routine is, is really important. And to teach these young guys, you know, draft, drafting Christian Braun, you know, NCAA champion who knows, played three years in college, who knows about a college routine, but establishing a pro routine and how fast, as you know, Chris, that is, uh, in and out of cities, uh, eating right, sleeping right, uh, doing all the right things, getting your work in, not only him and then Peyton Watson, who was young from UCLA. He's, the, to me, we really got to make sure our player de development staff is really working with him. And I'm standing as there as well, establishing a routine and then trading for Kamagate, who uh, I'm not sure he's going to be here uh, this year, but whatever it is, making sure he has that routine, whether he's here or he goes back to Europe. That's awesome to hear. And uh, let's dive a little deeper into the routine. You mentioned yeah. some people that, uh, you know, you've come across and I know you've seen so many in your career. So what do you think are necessities in a routine? What do you think must be there? Consistency. Uh, and I didn't mention a guy who, as we know, is a two-time MVP. He has a routine. I, you know, my first year here in Denver was last year and came in and to watch his routine, you know, he was in every day whether we were practicing or it was an off day and, and he was, you know, in the weight room routine on the court, doing the same type of things, working on those shots that he's going to get in the game. And it's funny one day uh, Joker said to me, he goes, people think this is easy. This is not easy if you want to be good. <laughs> so uh, watching him. And I think all the greats have that. They have some kind of routine where if they show up at nine o'clock in the morning, they show up at 10 o'clock again, like I said, I saw Michael Jordan doing it at 38 and, uh, I, you know, playing 11 years, I established my routine and it just the consistency to do it over and over again every day is, I think, the biggest thing. And and that's what we uh, really stayed on Bones Highland about this year, being consistent with his routine and instead of being all over the map on doing one thing one day, been doing another thing this day. Uh, so that consistency is really important, Chris, I believe is the most important thing. Um, and then with that, then you, you've mentioned a few things that would be in the routine, actually. So like uh, strength and conditioning type of component uh, on court, um, getting treatments uh, yep. when they eat. What are some things we're missing in terms of other parts of a routine that you feel are important? Uh, I think that the other part we're missing is make sure guys want to come in and they, you know, when they are working on their routines, they they always say that, like, all right, I want to get some shots. It's more than just getting some shots. It's trying to make sure you understand the playbook and where you're going to get those shots uh, within your routine. And again, like I mentioned, watching a guy like Michael Jordan, I remember his routine in, in, in shoot around. He worked on his post moves till he was like at 38 years old, till he was like wet. And, I, and I, he goes, I work on all my spots. He'd go to the logo area in the post. He'd work on his fadeaway. He'd go to the elbows. So seeing him do that, you know, I was with a guy named Joel B last year who after shoot around always worked on the elbows, worked shooting the three and then worked on his post ups. And uh, Joker does the same thing. But knowing it's just not just shooting. I think that when they're young, they think, well, I'm just going to get some shots up. No, it's 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 working on uh, what how you're going to get your shots in the game. But then not only that is working on teaching these young kids how to do that with pace how to do that hard. Some of them, they come in and they just kind of doing it half speed. No, the great ones, when they worked on their routines, it was always full speed um, game intensity. What, what would be different? You're talking about on court and we're talking about player development. This is the off season. What would be the biggest difference from the time you played to now? Would it be the number of coaches that are on the floor helping a player with player development? I, 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 absolutely. It, yeah. It's definitely that, you know, the coaching staff definitely have grown, but not only that, uh, the biggest difference I also think is just some of the, the advancements in training, obviously. You know, we did basic bench, squat, you know what I mean, pull-ups, dips. <laughs> now, you know, these kids, you know, they, they're doing all kinds of stuff. They got all these different gadgets. I don't even know some of the stuff they're doing, to be honest with you. Chris, yeah, all the wearable technology, I know. Right, all the wearable. Yeah, they're doing all that stuff that's, that's helping them 
to advance their game. And, and we're seeing that. We're seeing, the, as you know, Chris, the popularity in the NBA and the way the game has grown. Uh, we've seen that it's really helping these kids uh, get really better. And, and when the young kids come in, we're seeing more skill than ever now, I believe, in the NBA. Talk to me a little bit about the difference between this routine and then development, because those things aren't necessarily the same Mm -hmm. in the sense that when you're learning, you're struggling and you're not going to be in a routine. So talk to me a little bit about that. Right. It's funny you said that. You know, I worked for a a guy named Nate McMillan for Mm -hmm. four years in in Indiana and and three years as an assistant when Frank Vogel was the coach. And Nate, Nate McMillan used to say, if you're developing your team, that means you're losing. Mm-hmm. people are just saying development but but you're right it's, it's different because that development you know I'm using guys that I'm in it right now a guy like Bones Highland I'm looking at his development I'm looking at his development from year one which it was okay he had a really good rookie year you know uh, but that development has to go further you know people are going to start studying your game people are going to start trying to take away your strengths people are going to start putting the better defenders on you which he saw in the playoffs uh, against Golden State when they put Gary Payton Jr. on him, uh, their number, you know, their number one defender off the bench on, on, on perimeter scores. So that development, you know, that's another step of development in understanding in big moments how, how to play with pressure in playoff games. And, and talking about a guy last year who had a terrific year who didn't play well in the playoffs, I'm going back a little bit. When I worked in Philly last uh, year, Tyrese Maxey, who didn't play well in the playoffs last year, but, you you know, being here, but watching him from afar and texting him and seeing his development and how he grow, how he grew from his uh, rookie year to his sophomore year. So that development is getting comfortable, knowing, uh, working on your weaknesses because everybody's going to, or strengths, everybody's going to try to take them away, but working on your weaknesses and working on your game and because the scouting also has gotten more intense with more coaches, right? Everybody, everybody's going to say, okay, this is, this guy wants to do this. We need to take that away. Let's see if he can do something else. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so different, I'm sure. And then uh, in terms of, uh, you know, team culture or the vision or the franchise yeah. and different things like that, is that part of the onboarding process for a new player? It, that comes it is. And, you know, I came, I came here to Denver where it's a great culture, you know, coach Malone has, and, and the staff before him had put, you know, Tim Conley who left and went to Minnesota, they really done a great job of establishing a great culture here in Denver. And obviously that culture is led by Joker. You know, you got guys like Jamal Murray who, who, who helped establish that culture. But uh, it's a great culture here. And so now you take a guy like, again, Bones or a Christian Brown or a Peyton Watson. We have a great, you know, I didn't mention player development staff as well that helps instill that culture. And you put those guys into that culture. And what you want them to see all the time, you know, uh, you want them to see a guy like Joker when they're young working out. You want them to see a guy like Jamal Murray. What is he doing? Aaron Gordon, you know, Jeff Green, who who's a veteran for us. So you want those young guys to see these veteran guys and what they're doing and how they're working on their game and what kind of culture has been established here. And for the most part, when they see it, they fit right into it. You know, example, Bones Howland, he's, he's fit right into this culture and it's, it's a very strong culture. And again, I give a, a lot of kudos out to Coach Malone who helped establish this culture here in Denver. Yeah, tremendous success as well. And uh, so who, who, who initially, so, uh, you know, new rookie comes in, who initially is talking to them about what the expectations are or what the things are that are happening, say, around the facility? And who, who's actually onboarding? Is that you as an assistant or is that someone else that's doing that? No, that's more of our player development staff. And, yeah. you know, uh, the, the main guy that we have who runs that is John Beckett, who we call him JB, who, who's great. Uh, he reaches out to them. He does make sure that you know, he gets them a routine and gets them into a schedule, into the gym and working on things right away. Obviously, we have a meeting on at the end of the season. We always have a meeting and this is what we want our guys to improve on during the offseason. And he writes up the plan and makes sure that that he gives them the message. And then we get then we establish a plan for the guys that we draft. But John Beckett is tremendous. He does a good job uh, of, of establishing um, that routine, that plan, and his staff. You know, again, I, I said it, that you mentioned that coaching staff has, has grown, but he's the head of player development here at JB. 
So uh, what are some of the things that help a rookie develop the routine? I imagine trial and error is a part of it because they don't know necessarily know what the best routine for them at the professional level will be yet, yet. So, is it, I mean, you mentioned referring to other players, but that doesn't also necessarily fit another player. So right. how do they actually sort out their routine? Right. I think the first thing, and I, I mentioned it early, uh, earlier, is, is being on time. So sure. first of all, if your morning, we call it vitamins, if your morning time is for 20 minutes, if it's at 930, then you need to be on the court at 930. So try to make them understand that first, that that being on time is really important, whether it's to your player development uh, session, whether it's to practice or to the games, to the plane, to the bus. Again, being on time is really important. And that's the first thing. And that that starts with our culture. So they got to do that first. But after that, now we got to establish, okay, what do we want, you know, well, we'll take a guy like Christian Brown. What does he need to work on? What does he need to do? Well, we know that, you know, obviously a, a national champion, uh, we know he's going to get in the weight room. We know he's going to have to get stronger. You know, he's an athletic kid, but we know we want him to make shots. So he's going to prove his three-point shooting. We'll talk about that. And then his ball skills, you know, his playmaking skills. When we put the ball in his hands, can he run pick and roll? Can he do those things? And then I think the biggest thing that, has come about in player development and one-on-one time with players, you try to carve out five to 10 minutes of some kind of defensive component. Yeah, they don't want to do it. We know these players, they, they want to work on their offensive game, but the biggest thing is, hey, you need to do a couple of defensive drills or you need to do one drill, whether it's at the beginning or at the end, where it's closing out, keeping the ball in front, whether it's working on uh, your hands where you can get deflections, but there's always one thing, and we try to incorporate that as well in the player development. So doing that and making – and, again, being on time is the most important thing for these guys to get here for their training room time and for their or PD time, player development time. It's, it's great stuff. You mentioned uh, defense and uh, defensive rules and the realities of defending, right. you know, in space versus the best players in the world now. Is that the biggest adjustment in terms of a rookie moving from, say, the NCAA to the NBA? I think it is. And it's not only just the one-on-one defense. It's the team concept. It is, 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 is our system, learning our system, learning not only our system, our terminology. You know, a lot of times, as you know, Chris, teams do things the same way. It's kind of like defensive rocket science, but there's different terminologies, and you may have – different presses and traps and zones and and trying to get them up to speed to that on the defensive end is really important. But not only that, trying to get them to understand the offensive terminology. I always thought one of the great things who gave me my first coaching job, Avery Johnson did uh, when I went to Dallas, like we would have classroom time in August and, and September for the young guys. And it was only just to teach terminology, would show – 10 maybe offensive clips, 10 defensive clips, and we would start implementing our terminology where when training camp starts, we don't want those guys to be blindfolded. We want them to hit the ground and running. And JB's doing that right now with the new guys. They're already starting to establish terminology. Uh, They'll do that all summer, Uh, probably take a couple weeks off after summer league and come back and continue to do the same thing leading up to training camp. Well, that's good. I was going to ask you how you do that, actually. Is it through video, through meetings, through on-court yeah. walkthroughs? And I'm imagining it's a combination of all that. It is. And not only that, again, ter- we, we talked about how the training uh, technology has grown, but scouting and video and all that stuff has grown. We'll shoot things right through to their phones. And I, I got a, a text the other day where JB's already taught the guys how to look at clips, how to look at videos and things on their phone. And, you know, things are just evolving really fast. We know that with technology. And I think that's great. It's it's funny. uh, All-star break. I'll tell a story. I was visiting my my son in Chicago doing all-star break, went up there to watch a Blackhawks game. And he was sitting on the couch looking at his phone. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm looking at my clips from the game. So it's not only in the NBA, it's in the NHL as well. (laughs) Yeah, that's such a great point about teaching them how to use the technology, because I know even from the college, there's an upgrade in terms of the technology and access to those things. Uh, Being on time, you mentioned 
Uh, what traits or what other traits or behaviors make it easier for a rookie to adapt? I mean, you mentioned Christian Braun, obviously coming from a very professional college program. Absolutely. Does that give him an edge? Does that help him a little bit? I think it does. I think that, you know, not only that, but a maturity aspect of, of, of being in school for three years. Mm -hmm. We know now kids don't stay long if they if they don't go at all. But uh, you can tell when you have draft workouts and, you know, I don't want to mention a lot of kids and names, but you can tell who's been in college three or four years, who comes in for draft workouts or who's been there one or two years. It's just it's an age difference. And we know that if you if you draft somebody, a Peyton Watson, who, you know, didn't get a lot of playing time at UCLA, but you look at the talent, you know, watching him scrimmage today, he's oozing with talent, but he's 20 years old. So it's going to take him time to, to get up to speed compared to a guy, like you said, like a Christian Brown, who who played a big role in a national championship uh, team and then stayed in college for three years. Yeah. And you don't have to talk specifically about Christian in this example here. Yeah. But, uh, it, it is, is it is it a case that you know, like we're already establishing his role for next year's team? Or does he get freedom first through this summer period to just play free? And then later you deal with a little bit more. We're defining his role for the next year's team. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, it's too early. Absolutely, Chris. You don't set a role. You want to you want to see his game this summer and see what he's able to do. And you don't want to rush into throwing him in the fire during the season as well. As you know, we didn't do that last year with Bone, Bones Allen. Uh, but, you know, you just want to see what he can do. And then later on, we'll say, OK, this is what we need you to do if you're going to get in and help us and get some playing time. But it's a process for all rookies and it should be. Uh, it's it's very few, as you know, Chris, especially on a team like us who, you know, we're pretty well built to get built to win right now. When we're not developing a lot of kids, but we do got to get him in to develop. But it's going to take some time because we got some veterans ahead of him. That, that, that we need to play. <laughs> so you definitely do. Than other teams, right? Yeah, that's great to hear. And another curious question is, I mean, my experience with pre-draft workouts is they're usually lacking in game representation. That means, I mean, you're not playing a lot of game-based stuff in pre-draft workouts. But you did mention that your first practice today had a lot of five and five and a lot of game-based stuff. So I'm wondering, is that lacking in the evaluation process that it's really hard to evaluate someone if they're not playing a five and five in your gym? Well, especially a guy, a coach it is, because obviously we got a scouting, scouting staff that's terrific. And now, you know, it's head, it's led by Calvin Booth, who, who is, I think mm -hmm. he's going to do a terrific job, who's awesome, who is uh, behind him as the GM here. Uh, and, you know, his staff, they watch these guys all year. And we just see them come in in a draft workout, do a couple of drill, shooting drills and maybe play three on three. It's hard for us as coaches to tell you know, who's good. And, you know, you get all these things about where this guy's projected, whatever, 15 to 25 and da, 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 da. But it's really hard for us. And so we depend on the coach, the um, the front office a lot in, in, in terms of uh, who we need to draft. And, you know, another thing I miss, we're talking about development and I apologize for this, Chris. I miss the guys who that have to develop when they're coming from a foreign country. We haven't we haven't gone there. You know, we got a guy like Kamagate who who grew up in Paris, France, who, you know, first time he's ever been in America. I'm talking to him today and he was telling me, you know, this is the first time he had ever been in the States. This will be the first time that he'll ever be in Las Vegas. And I can relate because you know, people don't know my career, but my first year out of college before cell phones, before anything, I played in Milan, Italy as a, a young kid out of Murray State. And I remember them uh, say, okay, this is where you're going to live when I came from the airport. And they're saying, this is your car out there. and You can go anywhere you want. And it was a five speed. And I was like, I can't drive a five speed. And they were like, well, you got to learn. <laughs> and, you know, I, I remember myself being in a foreign country by myself. And, you know, we can even go back and we know uh, Dirk Nowitzki, who uh, I coached and was a teammate, played with that, you know, he almost gave up and went home when he was a young kid in Dallas. Uh just because of the culture change and the NBA game compared to the European game. So I didn't mention those guys, but that's a, another, you know, obviously we have a lot of successful European or foreign players in the NBA now who, who, who has de developed and adapted well to living in the U S and uh, we got another guy, Kamagate, who's going to do the same, who I think could have a terrific career.
Uh, and that's a, such a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. And um, mm-hmm. is, is there someone specifically responsible for him in terms of helping him understand, you know, even the simplicity of opening a bank account in America or different things like that? Do we go to yeah, that extent? We, we have a couple of people that, that yeah. works on the development side, which you have to have now with so many young kids coming in who, like you said, can help kids open bank accounts, can help kids find a place to live uh, in the city and, and point them the right direction. Uh, to real estate agents and stuff. So we have a, a great group that two two people, uh, a lady and a man who does that job. And yeah, he's gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna help him a lot get established. That's great to hear. And you mentioned the excitement of being drafted in the NBA. So I imagine one of the hardest parts is to teach them appropriate rest and how to rest and how to unload, because that's gotta be a part of it too, because they're probably shot out of a cannon, just so excited to be there all the time. Right. It's funny that you bring, bring that up because when I coached in Dallas, when your uh, coach McMillan had a sleep doctor come in, which I always mm. thought was interesting the first time that I had ever seen it, because especially when you're changing time zones and doing different things. And the guy really was good talking about, you know, how to get naps, but maybe you're not tired, but still lay down you know, and how to get the proper rest. And and let's just face it, Chris, these guys are, are 20, 20 year old millionaires and they're gonna be in these cities and they're gonna, you know, it, it all plays into it. They're in the New York for the first time or they're in uh, LA for the first time, you know, they're gonna wanna go out. And I think that, you know, it's a, and I don't know if you can tell a young kid, you know, if he's 21 of age and he can't do what he wants. That's one thing about the NBA that, uh, that's another part of learning how to be a pro is learning how to uh, take care of your body and learn how to get your proper rest. And it's another development that they got to learn or you know, they're going to be out of the league soon. And that's, you know, you, you know, I've always been a guy who's been a straight shooter to players and give them stories of, you know, guys who try to live. We always said, we always said burning the candle at both ends in NBA terms. And don't get me wrong, there's some, some, and I won't call names, and you probably know them, but there are some great players that's been able to do that, but mm-hmm. the percentages are, are, are not very good, and, and I try to tell guys, don't go down that road at all. Well, as a general thing, uh, coaches in the NBA have told me that it's generally less that that, that happens nowadays than it did in the past, right. because, and the reasoning they said is because players come in understanding their brand a lot better. That because of social media and all these different things that, and you said you didn't have access to that or that wasn't a right. thing. So do you think that does impact them a little bit that they think of themselves a little bit differently because of that? I, I do. I think that, I think not only that, but I think that uh, also the, the training that kids are starting to train a lot earlier now. Kids are starting to get, you know, when we're kids, ah, we're going to play video games at three in the morning. We can still play a basketball game the next day. I think kids are thinking more about, you know, the rest and nutrition. I, you know, and I know my kids are because I see it on the NHL side. Again, I was just, you know, down in Dallas visiting them last week. And they're all about proper nutrition, proper rest, workout routine. And I think that you're seeing more and more young kids uh, established doing that at younger ages. You know, for example, my kids was doing that at, you know, 13, 14 years old. And it's like, you know, second nature. And I'm, I'm like, well, what are we going to eat at? They're like, well, we're going to go over here and eat healthy. I'm like, well, let's eat something unhealthy every now and then. <laughs> yeah. That's gotta be a part of it too. Balance is a big thing. So, but, uh, but they understand, I mean, your sons, as you said, they understand their brand and they understand their value right now. And it is a limited time, whether you play for two years or you play for 10, 15 years. I mean, it's still a limited time to make that type of impact, isn't it? You're absolutely right, Chris. And, and all these guys want to be, the one thing, I've never met a guy who came to the NBA that didn't want to be successful. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that now what you're getting that more and more guys are really listening to the blueprint and how to be successful and how to have a, a long career, you know, especially, you know, these guys are coming in now, we talked about 19, 20 years old and why they're coming in so early because they know that that second contract is usually your payday. So can I establish myself in the first three or four years uh, when I'm drafted in the first round, they're, they're guaranteed years. Now I'm in my pay, payday uh, years at 24, 25 years old. And I think guys understand that and that second payday in, in terms of establishing a career. Now you feel like, OK, you know, I've established a career after I signed that second contract. And now I'm eight, 10 years in and, you know, I'm a vet. 
Such a good point. And uh, I'm curious, let's speak just from Popeye Jones's perspective on this one, but uh, what are some ways to motivate a player who may not like doing something? Let's say it's nutrition. Let's say it's sleep habits. Let's say it's stretching something like that initially that they don't value the importance. Like, you know, it is important. So what are some ways to help them and motivate them? I think the the first way is obviously one-on-one communication and sitting down and talking to them and, and see if they can get it. Uh, if that doesn't work now, then after that, you need to provide some, some material for them to read, uh, some video for them to watch, um, get a professional, you know, sometimes we'll have a professional, the nutritionist, Hey, sit down and talk to them, work with them, go to the grocery store with them, you know, in this business. And, and you know, you've seen it, Chris, we, if guys don't get it, we hold their hands. If we mm-hmm. think that, they're, they're talented enough and when they get it, that they're going to be successful and they're going to be able to help your franchise. We're going to hold their hands and, and, and make them get it. Uh, but whatever are, are your veterans usually able to help with that? Like, are they yeah. willing to help with that? Yeah, they are. You always got veteran, you know, or that's, that's a good point you make, you know, the guy who obviously uh, Jeff Green, who's our vet, go, hey, go talk to Jeff Green. Yeah. Go, go see what he's doing. What is he eating for dinner? Uh, go ask him what his workout, you know, Jeff Green, he works out 12 months a year. You know, when I remember coaching a guy named Louis Scola and mm-hmm. the day we got eliminated by Toronto in the playoffs when I was in Indiana, the next day he was in lifting weights and uh, then he got on the gun with shooting. And I was like, the season just ended. And I remember Scola telling me, if I take time off, then I ain't going to be able to get back. And that's the type of person Jeff Green is now, it, it, you know, when you get to that age, you don't take time off because these young guys are coming and you got to keep working and stay in shape. You can't get out of shape. Well, both of those are great examples of what we would consider professionals, right? Both those players, like if you would describe them, they were professionals and they played for multiple teams for multiple years and in multiple situations and always were able to adapt. And that's pretty impressive, isn't it? That adaptability that players like that have. It is. I, I know, you know, I'm going to go back to when uh, I played. I remember going, getting in the locker room and saying, as a rookie, coming to the NBA after playing in Italy for one year, and it was Dallas, and we wasn't very good. But I remember I got to Dallas in uh, August, and we know how hot August is. So I went up early. They wanted to, to sign me, um, brought my contract out from my Italian team. And the trainer, the strength coach called me and said, hey, we're on the, the track in the morning at 9 a.m. in Dallas. So I'm thinking, okay, there's going to be some players there. It's August. I showed up, and the only player there was Derek Harper. We still laugh about it, who, who is one of my uh, mentors. Derek Harper was probably 32 at the time, and he was out there running with me. And, you know, I'm 22, 23, year, 20, 22, 23 year, years old. And I remember after I asked him, I said, where are all the players at? And I remember him saying to me, he goes, he goes the players on this team, they're not going to be in the league long. And I remember following him. And I give him a lot of credit for helping me as a young person. And you mentioned that, can the vets help you? And yes, they can. I had one that helped me and helped me establish uh, being in the NBA for 11 years. And that guy is Derek Harper, who I still see when we go to Dallas, he does their TV and I always give him a big hug and thank him. Well, credit to you as well for being aware of the importance of finding a mentor. And, uh, you know, and that that's really important, isn't it? And the, I'm imagining all great players and all players in the league who are still, you know, five years, 10 years later are in the league, have found someone that helped mentor them early on, right? Right. I agree with that. And you look, you know, not, you know, we're talking basketball, but you just look in business, right? Everybody has a mentor, you know, somebody who taught them or gave them an opportunity to, to be and help them to grow and to be what they wanted to be. So the same, the same in basketball, you, you got to find one, you know, I always tell the young guys that come in again, who I'd say, that's, I tell them, I said, look at Joker. Watch what he, watch what he, you know, watch what he's doing every day. So this guy, you know, I was telling guys that last year, told Bones that, watch what he's doing. You know, he, he's the MVP, but just keep, watch what he's doing. And he did. He, you know, he watched what he was doing. He saw his routine. He saw his treatment, the weight room, again, the court stuff. And he's like, well, the MVP, the MVP has got to do that. I got, I've got to do that too. And That's how, you know, when you have, when you establish a culture and you have a good team and you have vets like, like a Joker, again, like a Jeff Green, your young players. And that's, we talked about it earlier, having a culture, they see that. And then it's a lot easier 
to pull them in into your system and and get them to do the right things to be successful. I love talking to you about this stuff. And uh, I know during the season, generally you get assigned some players that are your guys pregame or whatnot or video and different things like that. And yeah. most most teams seem that you stay set with those players all year. Is that the same in the offseason? Are you assigned a player right now? Uh, no, not right now. But again, we, we talked about it here. Staffs has grown so big. I, you know, I mainly hear work defense and our yeah. player development staff has grown so big. So they they – disperse the players between themselves once the season gets started and they determine who, you know, I'm working with them in their PD player development session. I'm the ones that showing them game film. Now, every now and then, if I need to show somebody something, obviously, uh, you know, I spend some time with bones showing him spend Michael Porter jr. Before his injury. So I can always pull guys and, and show guys, you know, individually, a couple of things with Joker, I showed him. So I'm, I'm always able, our coaching staff is able to do that. But for the most part, on a consistent basis, the player development coaches are doing that. You mentioned Dirk and, uh, you know, famous is his pregame work, workout and routine, shooting routine in particular. And uh, I'm curious what your takeaways from watching him do that were. I mean, this differential shooting where he's shooting off balance, he's shooting off spins, he's shooting off one foot, all those yeah. different things. What were your takeaways? And did you try some of that? No, well, I was a player development coach when I really, really honed and I wanted to coach because, you know, I went back to Dallas and played one year, but I was hurt the whole year and my career was pretty much over and Don Nelson was the coach and he was trying to get me into coaching then because I, I kind of saw my career coming to the an end. But when I came back as a player development coach and then I really, really, and I was in the gym at night and noticed how he always did the same routine. One he did in the morning before practice, when he came back at night, if we didn't have a game, he did that same routine. Or if it was pregame, he did that same routine. Uh, on game day, he would do he would do the, the shoot around, then he would do that same routine, and then he would come back again at night and do that routine again before the game. And to see the consistency that he stuck with and the same routine and the same time, and he knew it it was a it was really really fun to watch how he just said this is what i need to do and and his coach hoger who would come over i used to love being in the gym with him at night uh when i was a young player development coach and and it's funny we said that because i have to tell you the whole story and when the dallas stars was playing i would bring my kids with me and mark cuban would let them sit in their suite sit in the suite and then when the visiting teams would come around after the game, the boys would get autographs. So it all worked out well. I was in the in the gym with Dirk, and they got to see NHL games and meet players after the game. <laughs> yeah, what great exposure for your sons and and for you, truthfully, too, to be able to go back and forth between those two worlds a little bit too. Right, and it's funny. I used to I I don't know if you ever been to the Dallas. They've got their own practice facility now, but they used to have this little gym in the arena in American airlines. And it was the practice facility before, you know, they branched out and, and built a separate one. And I used to always tell Dirk, I was like, man, I always know when you're here, when I show up at night, cause I hear the ball bounce. And I said, when you're not here at night, one day, the ball is going to be bouncing. It's going to be your ghost in, in the gym and down there <laughs> shooting. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Hey, maybe in the modern game, what is one of the surprising things that is now part of, indoctrinating a new player that maybe in the past you, you would have thought, well, why are they doing that? <laughs> That's a really good question. And I think the most probably is, um, hmm, good question. It's probably got to be just everything that comes outside of basketball to me. And I said, why? And what I mean by that is, these guys, you know, and obviously we got to do things in community, but the number of appearances that they have to do, um, not only that, the the treatment times, that was that was the biggest thing for me because when I played, it was like you didn't go in the training room until something was wrong. And so like or if, or if somebody saw you, it's funny, I was just talking to my kids about this. And I think the NHL is still more how old school. You see a guy in the training room is like, what are you doing in there? And and Seth was just laughing because Caleb was saying, you yeah, know, every time I go to the training room, if I needed a stretch or something, Seth would look around the corner like, what are you doing on the table? You know, such like, a hockey mentality, isn't yeah, it? <laughs> yeah. And now, like the way they do it now here in the NBA, all these kids, you get 15 or 20 minutes every morning to get on the training table. And and 
and I think that it helps with longevity. You, as we see, playing careers are longer. Uh, you know, the other thing that's obviously changed is rest. Uh, I'm, I'm getting better with that one because, you know, I grew up playing 82 games and now, you know, these guys are out with rest. Hey, I got to rest tonight. And we'll see it in the summer league. And I always thought, why are we doing the summer league? We'll see the top players, right? They'll play three or four games and then they'll be out for rest. And I'm like, well, they're 19, 20 years old. And uh, those two things are, are for me, I guess. And obviously, again, being just being uh, out in the community and learning how to like be on time for your appearances and all that. Uh, a lot of these guys, to be honest, we, we've done a better job in our staff and getting these guys to make sure they're their own time and, and do the things they need to do to be successful and, and help the Nuggets franchise grow uh, in the, in the, out in the community. You mentioned the, the Dallas new practice facility, and I had a chance when I was speaking in an NBA franchise to go to their practice facility, and they took me on a tour, and they explained why they put things where they put, put them. And I imagine, again, this is a big change, but putting the food at the front of the building and putting the security at the front of the building, the two things that they said in their own facility used to be at the back of the building, and they didn't get used as much because players now walk past it on the way in and past it on the way out. And that's such a curious thing, isn't it? That uh, it's, I mean, well, it's like funny you said that because uh, <laughs> it's funny you said that. Just remind me of something because you know, and I don't know if you ever been to Philadelphia 76ers practice. I have not. Already. So it's it's over in Jersey, but anyway, the food, the kitchen is upstairs. Ah. And I remember last year, and they got wonderful chefs there. It's, it's the the practice five star dining, food. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Five, yeah, the chef is unbelievable. But a lot of guys. Guys after practice don't want to watch, walk upstairs. Like you said, they walk to the door and they leave. And I'm like, go upstairs and bring some food, you know. And, and then we try to say, okay, maybe you know, we can sit some stuff downstairs for them to grab because you're right. Uh, those things that is important. You know, we talked about nutrition, but what I think that what, have, what we figured out in the NBA, right? If we're providing the food for them, they will eat it if, if they can get their hands on it. And so now we know they're eating the proper things uh, most of the time, if we're providing at least two meals a day, breakfast and and then lunch after practice. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's it's these little details that are so important sometimes. And, uh, you know, we, we think about this, too, because as a former player and a current coach, you can appreciate this. Your time to yourself is limited. So a lot of players want to maximize that time they have that's down. You mentioned already the number of appearances, et cetera. So yeah. that's got to be another part of this for a player is that they just value their own time. So if they can get it, they want to get it, right? Yeah, you're right. If they can get it, they want to get it. A lot of guys, uh, uh, when they get it, it's usually it's nap time for them. Yeah. It's the afternoon nap. And I think another thing that we didn't really talk about what you don't hear a lot of as a coach that I talk to guys about, and we know, Chris, and you don't hear a lot of people talk about, but, you know, when you become a millionaire, right, you won the lottery. And you have to, that's another part of your development. You can't let your family members get to you mentally because you're getting pulled each way. This guy needs this, somebody needs money for this. Another person needs money. That wears on young guys. And it's hard for young guys to say no, but at the same time, it can really, really mess you up your development. And, and you just feel like that, you know, I'm empty inside that I'm always having to say yes, or I don't know how to say no, or I'm having to change my phone number constantly because I don't want certain people calling me. Uh, so, but I always talk to young guys. And again, another part of development, you have to learn to say no, and you, you can't, you can't take care of an whole, whole army. You know, uh, we talked about it, you know, it's a, it's a short, 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 even when you have a career, right? It could be, if you have 10 years, it's great, but anything less than that, that money's got to last you all your life. So make sure you're investing it right and not blowing it on things or, or, or giving it away when you don't have it to give away, really. I'm so glad you brought that up because saying no is hard. And that's a development for all humans is learning how to say no. I can remember still teaching my wife constantly saying, no, it's okay to say no to like a commitment or an obligation or something that you think, okay, you got to do it. But to things that you don't necessarily have to do, it's okay to say no and value your own time. And that's yeah. a really hard process for all humans. So I can imagine it's even harder when it's millions, millions it of is. dollars. <laughs> right. But you're right. It, it takes time to develop it. And, you know, you try to put it in there early and hopefully they can get it, you know, by uh, years in, you know, because they're not going to get it at, at the beginning of the year. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. 
So financial planning, all that stuff that's usually handled more by the agent. Do players yeah. ever talk to you about some of that stuff? You know, because you've been through they, you know, That's part of, you know, as a coach yeah. and, you know, been through it and making money and making, we all have made mistakes with money and, mm -hmm. you know, knowing how to save it and do things. You know, I usually don't try to initiate it, but if, if people want to talk to me about, you know, what should I be doing with my money and, and or books or to read, you know, always try to give them advice and, and, and tell them about, you know, my experiences. I, I think that's the big part of being a coach that, you know, I, as being a player, I can talk to them about my experiences with money and, and money managers and, you know, all the above. And, and to give them that, that advice, I always thought, think that that's, that's something really special. And, but, you know, at the same time, you don't, you don't want to, it's, it's, it's funny, Chris, because you don't want to just be in their face about it. And you hope that, you know, they'll eventually ask you, or you try to bring it up subtle to them. And especially, you know, I hate to say it, if you see a guy who's who maybe not making a lot of money, but spending a lot of money, mm. and a lot of times I have in the past have initiated conversations about that, you know, hey, what are you doing? Because, hey, we know contracts are public knowledge and, you know, I see what kind of car you're driving or what kind of clothes you're wearing or jewelry you have, you know, I, that's when I, I would initiate conversation with you about, hey, what are you doing? No, it's great. You're operating in their self-interest and that's always got to be important. And I, I'm also curious, like as a former player and, you know, a good friend, so I can bring him up, Charles Class, for exam example, yeah. on your staff, yeah, two, two great people, great coaches, et cetera, but different experiences, right? One is a former NBA player, one is not. So I'm wondering, you both add value, but do players have different conversations with different assistants based on those two things? I think so. I, it's funny you say, and you, and you need that. You need uh, a mix of guys and different experiences. I think so. I think that, you know, as you know, Charles is, is a great coach and I actually being here this year, I've learned a lot. I'm always looking to learn from coaches. Uh, you know, Charles is uh, maybe more of a numbers guy, more of a tech tactician guy than me. Well, you can say it. He's, he's like me. He's a geek. He's a geek. Yeah. Up <laughs> out of basketball and all that stuff. Yeah, uh, no, we're sports science funny. and analytics and all that. I'm all good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's been great to hear, you know, that side of it, you know, because a lot of times uh, for me as a player and as a coach, I, I watch the film and see it first. And then, you know, I want to look at the numbers and the analytics and everything on things. Uh, I like my eye to tell me first, though. Uh, but uh, some of the things that he throws out has, has been interesting. And 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 we we it's funny you, you brought him up because we would double team bones during the season. Like one day, all right, I got the clips, you know, before a game. And then the next one, I'll say, I got the clips. Now he's, again, what you just talked about, he's getting Charles' per perspective. Or, hey, this is what you should be doing. But then he's getting mine as well as a player saying, look at this right here. You know, you got to be better. So uh, definitely uh, you, you got to have a mix of guys on your staff like that. And it's been great and uh, to work with him this year. And I can't wait for another year to, to be with Charles. Well, I'm sure anyone would love to be on either of your staff someday. You guys will both be outstanding as head coaches or assistants. But what a great example. Thank you for bringing that up because I think that's such value to, you know, whether you're a high school coach or college coach or wherever you coach, to have two different people provide a different perspective on the same topic can only add value and strength to the conversation. Right. And, and, you, and, you, and you hope, Chris, that it, it eventually gets through. One of us get through. That's the other thing that, you know, it's not a competition uh, being coaches. And we, you know, we don't look at it like that. We're just hoping that we can get through to him and to, to teach him what we need to teach him. And it doesn't matter how that breakthrough happens. We're both happy when it does happen. <laughs> what, uh, you know, those stubborn conversations sometimes are the stubborn players in those conversations. What are some ways that you've found are the art to be able to get through to that player? Oh, that's a good one. I think that, you know, yeah, you're going to have guys who are set in their ways or stubborn. Um, that, that wants to do things their way. But I think that when you just said it, it always goes, it comes back to the numbers. For guys like, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Well, let's go look at your numbers. Let's look at maybe your shooting percentages or I, should, I, I can shoot that shot. Well, let's look and see what you shot the last month because as we know, the numbers don't lie. So if they want to be stubborn about something or stubborn about I'm playing defense, well, let's go see, you know, what what uh, your opponent's shooting percentage is. Again, there's so such a wealth of 
uh, information out there now on the NBA game and all these different websites. And, you know, as you know, Chris, there's everything where you can look up. And a lot of times the players, it's funny, but players sometimes they don't, they don't know who they are. I hate to say that. So you have to show them those numbers and show them. And then you back it up with video. You always show them numbers and back it up with video when they're being stubborn to get your point across and to get them to change and get them to do the things that you need, need them to do, not only for them to be successful, but for, again, it's always about the team. It's, it's never personal. It's always about the team. It's always about winning and it's never personal. And you make sure that they understand that, you know, Never personal. Papa, you brought up Don Nelson. So I'm going to ask you about some of the coaches you've been around in your career. I'm wondering how they've impacted you as a coach. And uh, let's start with Don Nelson. I'm sure you have some great stories, but uh, right. <laughs> and feel free to share one. But also, what are some things that have impacted you as a coach? I think, first of all, innovator. I think that you look at the game now. Don Nelson was playing this game, you know, small ball game. Uh, before other teams ever wanted to play it, putting three, four guards on the pl- on the floor with a center. I remember uh, playing golf with him one day in a conversation before teams even started doing this. He said, if I can ever find a five-man, a center, who can shoot threes and block shots, he goes, I'm going to really be successful. And I remember thinking about that because at the time, right, centers wasn't shooting threes. And I remember thinking about that. I was like, that's pretty interesting. And now if you look at the game, right, it's all five out. You know, everybody's playing five out basketball, five guys around the perimeter, um, playing driving kick basketball, shooting threes. And I think the biggest thing to learn from Nelly is his offensive uh, genius um, of, of playing that style of basketball before anybody ever, you know, wanted to play that way. And, you know, he never won, a, as we know, he never won an NBA title, uh, won a lot of basketball games, but, you know, he never could get that center that could, could shoot threes and, 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 and also protect the rim. He tried to have him in Golden State, right? I'm sure you remember Manute Bowl. People awesome. were like, what is that big guy 7'7 seven, seven, doing out there shooting threes? But that was his, that was his reasoning on, on, that, on, on why. And now you look at the game now, man, you know, you got – your five men, they're doing both. They're playing out on the perimeter. Uh, they're handling the ball. Uh, you know, we got the best passing big man ever, I think, in the NBA. And uh, so the game has changed, and Nelly, I think, was the first to do that. And I, I take all the offensive stuff that I learned from him, and I um, try to keep that in the back of my mind and incorporate it in my coaching. Do you, do you feel like being around him has helped you be more innovative as a coach and more open-minded? It has, it has, you know, again, it's, it's, for example, it's your five man. Again, I just mentioned Joker initiating offense. It's your four man. And he would just say, I remember at practice sometimes he would be like, all right, run thumb down, but point four, telling the four man, you're the point guard. And I remember going, I wonder why we're doing that. Or he would say, okay, let's run a play five man. You take the ball. You're the one, one, you're the five. And he would move guys around like that. And that And it was amazing sometimes to me to see as a player to see how guys, believe it or not, couldn't run the play from a different position and how important that is. And I'm sure that all my we're talking about summer league and all the summer league teams always had a fun day of practice. And I would do that like the end of it, like to because to make them understand that you should know everybody's position you should know what everybody's job is it's just going to make you, your team better it's going to make you a better player uh doug collins who you played for in washington doug great x's and o's guy perfectionist uh i learned a lot about him about doing things uh, uh when i say x's and o's but doing thing with great timing I remember he was go- his hip was going out a lot of times, but when we would do five on no script, he would get a chair and sit at center court. And if a screen was late or if the ball was supposed to have been passed a second too early, it wasn't, he was on you. I thought he was hard for young guys, but it helped me to understand uh, in terms of timing, screening angles and things like that. He was really good in teaching that. And I take that from him in terms of offensive execution. 
Uh, you also played for now one of the greatest college coaches around, which is Leonard Hamilton, uh, now at Florida State. So what did you take away from him? Yeah, I played with Leon, Leonard for one year in Washington. And, and we know, you know, he wanted to come and try the pro game. And, and, and Michael was actually, Michael Jordan was in the front office the year he came. Uh, you could, The thing about Leonard, and, and he's a friend now and learning about him, he's he's a big togetherness guy. And that's what I learned about. And we talked about it earlier with NHL and and NBA, but he's a big family guy, togetherness, and we've seen him do that at Florida State all his number of years, that that togetherness and that family atmosphere that he provides. Uh, he tried to do that at the pro level, but I don't think it was – guys wasn't ready for that. Uh, but as we know at the college level, that you need that, and that really works. Yeah, it's interesting to hear. And uh, you mentioned the 76ers and being with them the past years, and Doc Rivers coaching under him. What are some takeaways? Mm-hmm. Well, first, uh, I think Doc is great in terms of I didn't realize, uh, you know, how hard Doc, Doc, how hard Doc works. Doc is a very, very, he watches a lot of film. He works hard. Uh, he's big about his X's and O's, about his, his, his defensive uh, philosophy. He wants to do things the right way. And not only that, I think the biggest thing with he knows how to communicate with NBA players. He knows how to keep guys together. He knows how to keep franchises together. And I think behind the scenes, people don't see that, but he's probably one of the best coaches I've been around in keeping the key. We call them fires. And he can see a fire happening before the fire even starts. And he puts that fire out really quickly and to keep his team together. So that, uh, what I learned from him the most is about putting fires out. And another guy you didn't mention that, was was good at that is also Nate McMillan. Mm, he's right. really, really good at putting fires out, keeping his team together, understanding that, you know, his strengths and numbers. And, and with Nate and Doc doing that, putting fires out, is it just a case of they identify it early and then they address it early? Yeah, they, they're very good at identifying it early. Just bring uh, it out in the open? Yeah, they bring it out. Maybe they see a bad body language or a guy looks somebody off in the game. They don't, they, you know, they don't let it fester. They're sure it in film the next day. Hey, let's talk about it. We're grown men here. Again, it's, again, it, nothing's personal. It's all about trying to get the best out of your team and we all want to win. And, and I think that's the reason they do it. This has been such a fun conversation. I cannot thank you enough, Bye bye for sharing the game with us. Well, Chris, thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate it. I'm sure you'll be watching Summer League. I'm ready to head out and watch some some hoops, some summer hoops myself. Glad I'm glad it's indoors since we're in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks for having me. All right.